Good evening, everyone. June 23rd, 2021. We have a um, special meeting and then we have our regular meeting following that. And I think we will start. Uh, oh, I probably should wish everybody a belated happy Father's Day who is on this call and people listening and can't can't forget the the fathers they don't get enough attention so we gotta we gotta give them a shout out whenever possible um so um let's do the pledge i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all Probably need to take attendance as well. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Trustee Kazada. Present. Trustee White. Present. Trustee Fritchie. Present. Is Trustee Lopez with us yet? I'm not seeing him. Okay. And Mayor Levin. Present. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the public who wishes to address the board with regard to the one agenda item that is on the special this uh, this uh, evening special meeting uh, agenda? Uh, there is one person that just came on. Uh, if you uh, VTB are interested in speaking on the uh, special meeting item, please raise your hand, and I will bring you over. Raise your virtual hand. Well, obviously, I know they, they know we can't see them. <laughs> okay. I don't know who VTB is. Maybe you do. So I do not. Okay. This okay. is called the, the one minute stall in case VTB does want to discuss anything. We'll give them time to finding the little hand. And the minute is up. The stall is over. Okay. Right back to you, Stuart Kahan. Thank you, Mayor. Revision to park with program rules and procedures. Whereas on April 21st, 2021, the Board of Trustees adopted Local Law 2 of 2021, amending Chapter 216 Sidewalk Cafes of the Village of Austin Code. And whereas the local law became effective on April 29, 2021, upon filing with the Secretary of State. And whereas the local law included new provisions relating to outdoor dining, commonly known as parklets, in addition to sidewalk cafes. And whereas the village promulgated rules and procedures for the parklet program. And whereas numerous businesses have applied for and received permits to operate parklets through October 31, 2021, and whereas the introduction of the parklet program has been a learning experience for both the village and the involved businesses, and whereas the village has been considering revisions to its rules and procedures relating to the installation of coverings for the parklets, which are located within the village's right of way. Now, therefore, be it resolved that effective immediately, the rules and procedures for the parklet program are revised as follows. Businesses desirous of erecting coverings for the parklets other than secured table umbrellas must utilize commercial grade pop-up tents that meet NFPA 701 fire resistant requirements, which tents must be properly weighted and secured pursuant to manufacturer's instructions and be it further resolved that effective immediately, the rules and procedures for the parklet program are further revised to require that the secured table umbrellas and tents must be removed and stored overnight when not in use, and such coverings must be removed in the event of a severe weather occurrence, and be it further resolved that effective immediately, the rules and procedures for the parklet program are further revised to require that should the applicant for a permit to conduct outdoor dining in a parklet want to construct a covering for the parklet other than the aforementioned secured table umbrellas or commercial pop-up tents, the applicant shall obtain from the village's Department of Public Works a permit to construct such covering within the village's right of way, which permit application shall include plans signed and sealed by a professional engineer, proof of insurance, and the required permit fee, and that the same professional engineer shall submit to the village engineer a certified letter acknowledging that the covering installed at the parklet has been completed pursuant to the submitted plans. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Comments from the board. Um, I'd like to just uh, kick it off. Um, first of all, I thank the staff for putting this together. A whole bunch of people were involved in this. Um, 
in my own um, understanding of this, I think there are a couple points I want to underscore, uh, which I think speaks to uh, the fact that there are reasons why sometimes legislation takes long to pass. It's, it's purposeful. There are discussions, there are changes, there's communications, there's public meetings, etc. People usually say government moves too slowly, but there's actually a purposeful reason for it. On the other hand, uh, we had a pandemic and a number of things that were done for the past year, including this one, came as opportunities that was brought in front of the board for opportunities to help, um, in this case, small businesses, specifically in, in restaurants. We have a little bit of a challenging topography. We're on a hill on, on parts of our village. You know, the sidewalks are very narrow in other places. They're wide in others, etc. So nothing is a template that fits everyone's needs. And when it gets windy um, and we get rain and wind all year long around here, um, you know, these things could fly around. People can get hurt. And it's all on public space because it's on sidewalks and it's on with the parklets, it's on parking spots. And then there's the parking issue of giving up parking when there's a lot of discussion about parking. All of that goes to say that I think that in this case, things were done super quickly. Um, kudos to everyone that put it together, dropped other things to get it done. There was a lot of community involvement. There were some folks who um, wanted us to change things on it because maybe we missed something or others. So, so thank you, Stuart, for also including that it was also a learning experience. We don't often see that in these write-ups uh, between all the whereases. You don't always see that. So I appreciate that. So that for the record, there's an understanding that there was a lot of reaction and adjustments made, and they'll continue to be. I never heard the word parklet until this year. So, you know, it starts from that. Um, I think this is a great effort. I think every community does the best it can across our county, including Ossining. Um, always a challenge. And there are a lot of things on the table to look at before we um, do these kind of pieces of legislation. And this special meeting was actually is another product of let's get this done really quickly. Really quickly sometimes mean you might need to make adjustments later on. And who knows, in two months, we might need to make another one. There is an end to all of this um, efforts with the parklets, which I believe is the end of October, where everything will have to be removed. These are not permanent structures. So I do appreciate the staff. I appreciate all of the business owners who came forward. I appreciate all the back and forths. And I'm glad that we're here tonight. Um, I am um, happy to move forward. I would like to ask if any other trustees have anything to add. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm looking at the gallery. Okay, I think we'll go to the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And welcome Trustee Lopez. Lopez. May we have a motion to adjourn the special session and move into work session? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We are now in work session. Thank you all. Okay, so I'm going to move. I'm trying to. I'm just want to bring up the agenda. So, okay, I think we should go to um, any announcements from the trustees. We've already taken the roll call. I can go. Thank you. Uh, last week, I had the pleasure of uh, attending the Hudson Valley Volunteer Firemen's Association convention. And we had the honor of naming three of our firefighters Firefighter of the Year, which is a prestigious honor throughout the Valley. Those three firefighters made a heroic save at a house fire on 59 North Malcolm Street. Those firefighters were Chief Mike Scarduzio, then Captain Dan Farrell, and ex-foreman Patrick Wheeler all well-deserving and um, the department was spoke of very highly. Our department is very well respected up in the Valley. And I just want to make it known for anybody that doesn't know that, uh, you know, these guys do this because they want to do it. And I, I know I was once a recipient of that award. So it's, it's nice to be recognized. Bob, were you done or was that, were you done? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Oh, okay, okay, Thank great. You. Well, I'm glad you brought it up. I've been following it on Facebook. Some very proud parents, very proud family members, very proud community members. Uh, I thank you for bringing that forward and explaining it. Um, you know, the, not much to say, except we thank um, all of our volunteers for doing the heroic work that they do. I, I think that says it all. And thanks for bringing it um, to the foreground. Anyone else for announcements? I'm seeing no, I'm seeing no. Okay. Okay, everybody must want to get back outside while the sun is still up. It's still one of the long days of the year. Okay, getting the hint. Um, so I wanted to just remind everyone, we have July 4th coming around the corner. Um, so if any organizations do want to come and, and let Jamie Hoffman, who does a lot of the communication, and let us know if there are any events going on, that's great. There won't be fireworks uh, for now, but they will be rescheduled for later in the year, which I think is sort of cool. Um, usually a big event. Um, ironic, uh, we feel like we're in post-pandemic world, but as many of you know, I also work in a community center where there are lots and lots of children. They are not vaccinated, and there are still um, issues uh, with the pandemic. Um, we've reached another milestone about a week ago of over 600,000 deaths. It just feels like uh, we have it behind us, but we're still in it. Uh, so I just want to remind the public of why we're still being careful and why we still have to maintain uh, some social distances under certain situations. Um, so I think the fireworks will be really neat um, towards the end of the summer rather than maybe in the middle of summer. And I think that's really a great thing. And there will be more and more events. We had a lovely Juneteenth event. Would love to see that uh, going forward for the next uh, as many years as we can. I very much enjoyed um, the education part of it this past Saturday. Beautiful, beautiful day on the waterfront. Um, Trustee White was with me when she made her speech, when I made her come on the stage, the microphone worked. When I made mine, the microphone did not work. Um, that must have been a message from high up above. Um, it was very lovely and Joy Sharako was there. It was a lovely event. I hope more people come out um, uh, for it in the future on the next June um, 19th. So. Um, I think we're ready to roll and move forward. I have only one request from the village manager who's going to take over is there were a number of other um, pieces of business that we had for the agenda. I just do want to have a brief explanation to the public who does follow um, why they were taken, taken off. Uh, because for those that do follow, I think they would just like to possibly for the record understand why they were taken off this week for tonight. Sure. So um, we had two items pertaining to um, uh, really water treatment. Um, one was a, an update on on the plant, uh, our new plans for the uh, plant plans for the new plant, and another one uh, dealt with um, a uh, monitoring service that that we want to employ. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, there was a scheduling. Um, it really was a, a communication issue and Andy and Paul were not able to join us. So uh, we are just going to postpone those, but you will be hearing them from them shortly. So apologies for that. And then we were also going to hear from a developer at 14 Water Street. However, um, subsequent to making the, um, uh, you know, he had requested to be on the agenda several weeks ago, there were substantive changes to, to the plan, which we did not have a lot of information on. And uh, he conveyed to us that he had a, a separate issue that he wanted to discuss that was really more appropriate to be stuff at a legislative session. So we'll probably be seeing him at the July 7th meeting and then uh, hearing about the project at a later date. Thank you. I hearing you say July 7th and me speaking about July 4th, I obviously missed an important issue, which is that we're having between before then town hall meeting on our fifth Wednesday for June 30th. Uh, open mic, as I like to call it, which is to just hear what the public has to say. The, the, the folks who live in the village of Austin or have a relationship to the village of Austin, um, we're going to just um, want to hear what the public would like more information on, what they want to share with us um, as a forum for an open um, engagement with the community, uh, 7 to 8.30 on Zoom. 
And I put that in my mayor's update. Apologies that it went out a little later than usual. And um, you can find that. I think it's on the website. Am I right about that, Jamie? Or am yes. I uh, you can access it from the mayor's page and directly from the home page. There's a box that says mayor's message. Right. So we hope to really get some vibrant, um, interesting conversations. And we hope we could also inform the public. But more importantly, we hope the public will inform us. So I appreciate that. And um, I think we can move on, village manager. Um, thank you. Um, Sir, were you going to say something? I just saw you unmuted. No, no, I, I've oh. been unmuted. So. OK, I'm sorry. I, I just didn't want to. Um, so first up tonight, we have an update from our uh, village town clerk, uh, Suzanne Donnelly. So I'd like to turn this over to Clerk Donnelly. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I'd just like to give you an update of what's going on. So in the clerk's office, we have essentially moved all forms, licenses, and permits online to electronic versions. With combined licenses, refreshment, cabaret, sidewalk cafe, and coin-operated machines to peddler's licenses, which we're starting to see uh, some interest in, uh, to games of chance and alarm permits to train and muni lot permits. This has proved to be very successful with quick turnaround for the end user. In the case of the trains and the muni lots, we're using passport application, which is working very well. We are working with them to create a support protocol system so that when we have an issue or a special So you muted. You muted. So. So. I think. And train station. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Did so you, you um, went out, so we couldn't hear you at all, and I don't think you could hear us, so we missed that part of the Sorry about probably that. Probably the last couple of minutes. Okay, so that would be the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, can you hear me now? Because I am i don't see, oh, now I see myself um, uh, with a square around me. Not through where you were talking about uh, using for the train passes passport, okay. working very okay. well. And it was after that. Thank that you. Was. Thank you, Trustee White. You're welcome. We are working with them to create a support protocol so that when we have an issue or a special request, we have a chain of command for support of the product. This package gives all its end users all of his or her information, and they only have to update it when new information is needed. The key to that is that users need to remember their, pa uh, their account number as a method to enter the system. We would like to stress to people, do not create more than more accounts than uh, needed because it will cause problems in the future. If you forget your account number, you can call the office and Martha will be able to find it for you. And then you keep it in a safe location. This is one of the big pros when the people go on to buy their train station permits or their muni park permits, all their, their information is on and only needs to be adjusted as needed. In the case of other licenses, permits, and forms, we are using seamless docs and are investigating at this point our options to doing renewals of forms. We have a call on Monday to discuss how this will be, um, how will this will work and how it will be the greatest ease for the end user. In the office, we have created QR codes. I didn't even know what a QR code was, like a parklet. I didn't know. <laughs> for most of our online forms, which eases the need to make constant copies saving many trees in the process. We even have QR codes at the police station in case someone needs to FOIL for information they are requesting from the police. FOILs are currently our most time consuming task in the village. We currently have 353 this year with most of them being with the building department. As we move forward with the new application that will allow people to see information about properties, FOIL requests will go dramatically down, and we're looking forward to that. All FOILs are accepted online, resulting in quicker distribution, reaction to sensitive dates, and the filling of the FOILs easier than ever before. We have to remind people to be specific about the information they are requesting, and know if they're requesting the information from the town 
or the village, two completely different municipalities and therefore two different foils. Other responsibilities, we have become the uh, responsible for the taxi drivers and the taxi companies. We have worked with the police departments to ensure that we are always working to do a better job of issuing licenses and medallions to those who understand the rules of the road and about treating people in a courteous manner. We would like to hear from you on the, who, those who use the local taxi services on how the companies are doing. Compliments, as well as complaints and suggestions, are always appreciated. Please feel free to contact me at sdonnelly at townofostening.com. We are the keeper of the records for both the town and the village of Ostening, and we now work electronically on most of these files. We have been assured that all of our files are backed up into four locations daily, ensuring the redundancy that is required by New York State. The a file retention grant that the town received in 2018 has helped both the town and the village eliminate hundreds and hundreds of pounds of needless files while allowing us to build a state of an art retention room that allows staff to retrieve files as needed. Major kudos goes to everyone who worked on the project, including Trustee White and Shannon Riley. Our true heroes are the maintenance staff for the village of Ossing, who do not, not only help shelve all the boxes, but continue to work with the sh uh, on shredding outdated files with Westchester County. We are so lucky to have so many dedicated folks working here in Austin. As we become more productive, we are able to do more and serve, do more and get more done and to serve the residents, business owners and visitors of Ossing with efficient backups at a minimum. Our offices are recently updated and refreshed. They not only are more welcoming to the um, welcoming as only office visitors, but um, I'm sorry, can come and but to, it also helps us to be more productive. Working for two municipalities can be too, very demanding at times, but we manage it with myself, my deputy Martha, and our outstanding part timer Janet. Our team is rounded out by a member of the finance office, Maggie, who was exceptional. We have made it through the pandemic being opened and available all the time. We continue to learn new things every day and work with the fa all facets and levels of the government to help them to become more efficient as possible. We are always available to assist staff, residents, visitors, and business owners. Thank you. And we had a lovely election last night, so we worked very late. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Um, welcome, Sue. Nice to see you again today. <laughs> I don't see you very often and twice in one day. It's great. Um, any comments? I have a couple of questions, but let me throw it out to the folks, my colleagues. Anybody? Uh, I will go. Just uh, say first, uh, also welcome and thank you for the hard work, Sue. Uh, and I want to reinforce the importance of uh, what you're doing to uh, digitize the works of the work of the clerk's office. Uh, it goes a long way, not only making your work more effective and efficient, but also as a member of the community, it makes accessing information and being able to uh, do what we have to do uh, as well as possible uh, go well. So I really appreciate your work there. It's a huge project to overhaul all of those pieces uh, into a digital version and, and that it is ongoing work, but uh, uh, applause and uh, uh, carry on uh, for more of that. Great. Thank you, Trustee Lopez. Anybody else? Um, I had the opportunity to stop by the clerk's office the other day and it does look great. Uh, it's been repainted and spruced up and it's very nice and clean and um, paintings rehung and I think that uh, all the work they do there, they really keep this village humming along, you know, they deal with a lot of people every day, a lot of different types of requests, so I, you know, I appreciate all the work you guys do, Sue, thanks. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I could go. I can say oh, a few okay. words. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, I know it's uh, it's been a challenging year uh, through this pandemic, and you know, uh, you know, I do appreciate all the stuff that you have done uh, for us in it, um, not just the village, but for us in it uh, within itself. So, um, you know, it, it it obviously takes time 
for technology or community members to get used to the technology part, which it has become an advantage for a lot of stuff. Um, so I just want to say thank you for all that. Um, you know, I do send you emails random sometimes in regards to different issues. And, you know, I do appreciate you taking the time, you know, looking at it and replying back. So, you know, I, I know it's a challenge for everybody, but I do appreciate all the stuff that you do. And I do have to stop by the office. I haven't seen that space. So maybe, maybe next week at some point. So, Sounds thank good. You. I do want to just thank you for bringing that up. It is a training year. It is a learning curve year for everyone, including us in the office when we when we move everyone over to electronic form. So we're there to help you. Um, uh, we try to be as patient as possible and, uh, and work together to get that done. So thank you. Great. Um, thanks everyone. So Sue, I just had a couple of questions. First of all, I did enjoy, I happened to, I had to be um, in the village hall this morning um, to take care of a couple of things. So I, I said hello to everybody. And um, I really um, learned during the pandemic that um, historically buildings have moved from tile to, well, wood, then tiled and carpeting wall to wall because of the soundproofing and all that. But in a pandemic, I also learned that communal areas where there's a lot of traffic, actually rugs are not great. Um, that actually the newly found sort of flooring that you guys have put in, uh, not expensive and last a long time and they're waterproof against mold and all that. So I know like it's not sexy stuff. I say this a lot at our meetings, but honestly, you do deal with a lot of people. All your folks do. It's one of the high traffic areas. It's not quite the community center. We wouldn't want it to be, but it's a high traffic. So I appreciate that. So you, we, we know about a few of the projects because you and Maddie have spoken here before about some of the projects you're working. I know foils, um, are a big deal. I know that Stuart Kahn has spoken about just the volume of foils and how, and he said it before, how the new technology has just made a world of difference. So, so, and you guys work as a team and, and the legal department's involved in some of the foils, the building. But so I hear the word files a lot. What other kind of files so that the public knows do you guys file? I mean, you don't just do building departments. You do marriage. Oh, no, no, we, we, we actually don't do any building department files. No, but you get a lot of the foils that then get oh, sent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but what kind of, of filing um, do you guys do? What are the big chunks of categories? Well, all in the past, all of those permits and licensings, you had to keep the hard copy. You had to keep a hard copy of every single taxi driver that had a license, every single taxi company that had a license. Every contract that's signed, we keep the uh, we keep the um, uh, really signed copies of them, but uh, we do everything electronically now. So we went from having two walls of file cabinets to having three file cabinets. So we do ha still have some paper there, but it's a tremendous amount. We're doing we're we're, we're edging on doing 200 wedding um, not weddings but marriage licenses this year. Um, we 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 have. We have to keep all death records. We have to keep the very small amount of birth records. If you, if someone chooses at this point to have, um, to have a child at their home, then we would have, and they lived in Austin, then we would have a birth record for that. But uh, we go back to the 1800s in our death records and our marriage less records. And until 1955, when Austin Hospital closed, we had we have birth records from there too. So we have a ton of files. We have what's called the records room and it's wall to wall books and it's all the old files that were kept for many, many years. Um, we still keep a hard copy of marriage and death certificates, um, but most of it is scanned in and um, you know, it, it, you, that's one of our backup systems. So there's a tremendous amount of files. Stuart and I are constantly uh, emailing back and forth. Every time he has something signed, it comes down to us. We also are, the first step in the, um, if somebody has a claim, and uh, we are the first step uh, where, um, it, actually I'm the first step if we have any other issues that go on because it's my job to get it to either Stuart or to the attorneys in the town and um, notice the claim and such, and such. So we have a lot of variety. It's, it's very fast moving. Um, I was just thinking that today because, um, 
I, I said, we switched topics about 15 times today just so that we could keep up with what we were trying to do. So and if anybody's interested in, uh, in seeing, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say um, the category that uh, you and I spoke about this morning also is about policies. So we have 13 committees. Their minutes and all that are stored. Do they go to you? Do they go? Where do they go? The 13 um, committees. Uh, no, we, we keep the planning and the zoning files mm -hmm. uh, because those are um, um, they're, they're government boards, right? So um, we do not keep the minutes uh, from everybody else, but we keep everybody we keep every single minute of, of village board meetings and town board meetings. Uh, and as I said before, the two planning boards and the two right. zoning boards, but we also keep everybody, um, um, everybody that joins a group. We had a young man come in, he's joining the zoning board and he got sworn in today to join this. Uh, so he's had to sign the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have a lot of different files and it's just a, a lot of uh, different important things that people, and what we what people have to be able to get their hands on, and by doing this, we tend we'll be looking to do some more retention uh, grants too. But to do this retention grant has made it so much easier to find files and to know the proper retention time for the files. So um, it's been a big help, and we can find um, information a lot more quick quickly than they could before. So. Right. And one of the things that came up, Sue, and maybe it's not Sue, maybe Stuart, I actually don't know. Uh, when we did the police reform and looked at it, and I'm going to have another meeting um, regarding this, um, the policy books and all that, does a file have to be, uh, does something have to be filed with your office or is it strictly in the police department? Um, Stuart, like the policies and all that and procedures, is that is that with the no, clerk or? The, the, under the... Uh, reform proposals uh, will keep a copy in the clerk's office and, okay. uh, and, and they can be available for purchase, but it's actually not a, a requirement that it, it be maintained there. But we, we determined that if someone wants to get a copy and they want to come into the clerk's office, there'd be a few left there so that they could always get themselves a copy. Okay, and as I go through all of the things that are part of the village, and um, it actually occurred to me as Bob Fritchie was speaking, what about all the policies of the firehouses? Um, do they keep their own, or, or are those also supposed to be filed with the clerk? I, as far as I know, Mayor, there's no requirement that they be filed. I do have a set of the, uh, uh, the OFD uh, policies and procedures which were provided to me by the department, but I again don't believe there's any formal requirement of uh, you know filing those uh, with the uh, clerk's office. Great. Well, these are great. These are just questions that come up. We we bring Sue uh, on an as needed and I guess an annual update. So I appreciate. I hope I didn't take too much of everybody's time, but these were just sort of questions on my mind that I've been meaning to ask. Um, so thank you. Ms. Donnelly. Can, I just make, can I just make one more little announcement? Of course. We want to remind people that um, should they have bought, bought a train station permit um, and they did not want to use it for the last six months of the year, they may turn it in by June 30th. Um, if they find that they're not going, they bought their uh, train station pass, but they're not going back to work. It is for, I want to emphasize that it, when you do return your train station permit, it's for the last six months of the year. You are giving up your permit for 2021. Um, we so do you're saying it's forward. You can't, get a, forward. you can't get your money back if you didn't use it. It's for right. what you've paid that you might, that you thought you were going to use. You're not going to use. There's a time limit. Um, right. So it's going forward well, that you're returning right. and, and getting some. Some people. Uh, yeah, some people might have gone back to work and decided to retire or some something like that, or sure. their company moved. But um, but we just want to remind. Nope. Sue, I'm hoping you can hear because we lost you again. Got a beer connection. Yeah, I see that she's talking. Train station permit waiting list, and Moth is constantly refreshing that list and sending out. Um, invitations to get okay. train station. Permits. We sort of missed the last minute or so of what you said, um, <laughs> but my here's my suggestion because um, that's that now is a big topic uh, because of the way corporations are bringing people back, not bringing them back hybrid and all that, um, and they're all different. 
hundreds of companies, all different. So um, I think the big message that you're making is um, number one, you're available. If people have questions, they shouldn't wait till after the fact. They should, they should call your office or email you before the fact to find out what they can do as a possibility. We probably should put a communications out um, about this because we're in June now. Um, mm -hmm. We've got like three days left. So, um, you know, we should probably put something out. I, but most important message that we should be sending out somehow, um, whether it's on Facebook, um, et cetera, is for people to speak to you before, not after yes. things are done. Yes. If yes, I may. Yes, if I may, I never got a chance to comment, so I just. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, Bob. My apologies. That's okay. I feel like the redheaded stepchild, but that's all right. Um, I just, I'm not going to repeat what everybody said. I echo my colleague's sentiments as far as the clerk's office. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But okay. uh, yeah, so sure. we're, and our number is 762 8428. I must say that number a thousand times a day. It took me one week to memorize it. <laughs> which was, I think, a lot. But I want to thank you all and um, uh, look forward to talking with you and look certainly look forward to working with you in the future. Great. Thank you. We are back to Village Manager. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, we are looking forward. We've, we've gone through the comprehensive planning process. Um, thanks an and we're looking forward to our July 7th meeting uh, when the plan and the zoning text amendments will be in front of the board um, for uh, their approval and, and uh, adoption. But right now we have an opportunity to discuss uh, some of the zoning um, amendments. Um, I have, we have Jaime Martinez, our village planner and Stuart to Cahan to go over this. And, and it's an opportunity for the board to weigh in uh, on some of the things and, and provide, we can provide further clarification from staff. So uh, at this point, I will turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Karen. Uh, folks, I had uh, sent you a memo on Friday with regard to some of the, uh, uh, some of the issues uh, relating to the overlay districts uh, in terms of there were certain parking requirements that were in there which are different than currently exist within those particular zones. Uh, and there were some other, uh, other issues that relate to fees that will have to be set with regard to the community benefit fund, as well as with regard to uh, uh, a, what you might want to call a civic space opt-out fund. Uh, that that appears under the uh, for the downtown overlay uh, district. Uh, the and I just wanted to to bring those you know to your attention. Uh, I've been reading through the overlay district language uh, and did send a few questions today, uh, both to Jaime and to uh, the folks at BFJ. And I'm waiting to hear back from BFJ on on some of those. Uh, uh, BFJ has also been provided with a, a list of correct, some really more typos and just language changes relating to the comprehensive plan. Uh, a few things that I had requested that they do is uh, some of their data was based on 2019 information, uh, when in fact there is more updated information, which is you know accessible uh, from uh, you know various uh, government agencies. Uh, so I've asked them to just update it to that extent so that we can be, uh, you know, you know, we're not looking at 2019 fact, uh, figures, we can actually be looking at 2020 or 2021 figures with regard to that. So uh, uh, that, my understanding is we should have that revision of the comprehensive plan with those uh, corrections made most likely by the end of this week or very early next week uh, for uh, you know folks folks to look at. But uh, uh, you know, and I'll turn it over to Jaime now. But this was mainly to talk about uh, the zoning changes, and you will recall there were some changes that related to side side setbacks and with regard to driveway setbacks. Uh, there's no didn't appear to be many issues as to that, uh, but there were some questions with regard to the overlay districts uh, and uh, 
I, as I said, I pointed some of these out in a, in a memo I sent on Friday, uh, and I did have a few other questions for uh, the uh, uh, for the BFJ folks. Uh, one question, which I will throw out to the board uh, upon my reading today, uh, in the Croton Avenue overlay district, the board had determined that it did not want to uh, add additional height to the buildings. I think the original proposal was to go from three stories or 36 feet to four stories and 48 feet. The board, uh, my, my recollections did not want that. So what the, what the chart actually says is that the, it now says that the maximum height uh, is basically none. So I've indicated that that probably needs to be changed because we don't want an Empire State Building on the middle of Croton. Uh, so that can be done. But what I think is a more important question, and perhaps a, a deeper question, which is why I've asked uh, for, a, for an input from BFJ, is that whether or not, the, if the density bonus is not going to be granted within the overlay district uh, for Croton, uh, other than changing you know, residential and some setbacks, uh, you know, the real question is, you know, what are we doing in that overlay district? And that's sort of a more, if you might want to call it esoteric question. Uh, and I'm not, again, this is just the Croton district, not the, not the, uh, the downtown, which the board has indicated that they would uh, allow for an increase in height with a density bonus uh, of up to five stories or 58 feet. So with that start, uh, I just wanted to discuss this because next week, the resolutions that would be presented to the board would be to adopt the finding statement, adopt the comprehensive plan, and adopt text amendments. Uh, I should point out, and it's something that I believe uh, that you know we had a discussion with Frank Fish last week, but it is important to note, the text amendments do not have to be uh, approved at the same point as when you uh, uh, adopt the comprehensive plan. Uh, uh, it's helpful to do it, but if for any reason board members had any questions with regard to, let's say anything dealing with the overlay district, uh, that could be, you know, that consideration could be deferred is what I'm, what, what I'm saying. So uh, Jaime, if you have anything to add to what I've said or um, before the board has any uh, issues, Please yeah, please. yeah, I would. Um, so the, you know, obviously this has been a pretty iterative process and we've gotten, you know, I, I think at the beginning there was a desire to see a form-based code along uh, Croton Avenue as well as along uh, the VC district. Uh, so the, the idea behind sort of getting property owners to uh, adopt the form-based code, which includes some, you know, some, some concessions in terms of the design and setbacks and things of that nature, was to give them an incentive to do so by adding some density and making some uh, changes along the way with the, you know, making residential a, a permitted use. Um, it was decided uh, by the board at a certain point that they did not, you know, that you didn't want to see any increase in density along Croton Avenue. And so the challenge with, um, with that is that you're sort of removing the, the main incentive for it. Um, and, and so the, the alternative was brought forth at that time to say, well, hey, uh, why not just impose the new zoning with the setbacks and the design and everything else? Uh, and while that sort of makes some sense in theory that you could say, hey, we want this new design style, uh, it would also immediately render all of those properties that don't conform to that non-conforming. And so that adds a new challenge. And so part of the concept behind an overlay is that you allow the existing property owners to be conforming to the old code, but you have some incentives to get new properties or redevelop properties to go the direction that you want them to go. Uh, there's there's a lot of benefit to that, and um, you know the the incentives are, are kind of tied to that directly. Um, those incentives were also sort of tied to these community benefit funds that was requested by the previous mayor. So a lot of these you know have developed over time and. I think what Stuart has pointed out is is the challenge of the Croton Avenue overlay um, in, in really being effective <laughs> because the, the only thing that remains, I believe, and we're asking, um, you know, we're, we're asking that question of BFJ right now, 
but the only thing that I recall as being um, different is that uh, residence is no longer conditional use. It's now permitted use under the form base. And, and that's, um, it was stated by BFJ that, that, that they thought that might still work as an incentive. Um, it does provide a good guideline, I think, for the planning board to say to developers when they're coming in uh, and building that, hey, we really like this form based code and we want you to, you know, adhere to the setbacks and we want you to adhere to, to what we're requesting. So it provides a good guide, but it doesn't do a whole lot to change the dynamics of that, um, of that district in particular. So I, that, that's kind of the response. To the Croton Avenue district. Um, you know, if there are, are questions about other pieces I, where I can, I'd like to answer and where I can, I'd like to, you know, mark them down and, and get them, um, you know, get them answered to you. But as, uh, as Stuart mentioned, um, you do, you know, getting the comprehensive plan and getting the zoning text amendments is something that you're capable of doing under the EIS that's been um, done, but it's not something that you're required to. Okay, anybody? So nobody has any I guess, comments. I guess I could go. I okay. guess I could go see that. Nobody else wants I mean, nobody to. Nobody has to have a comment, but I'm no, I, I, know, um, I'm opening the door. No, no, I appreciate that. And and I do appreciate Stuart and, and Jaime in regards to that. What is what are we doing? Sure, with overlay, we're doing the overlay. We don't. What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Sure. Um, I'm okay with not having the overlay in that portion if it limits the other stuff. I mean, we do have architectural guidelines. Uh, there's some very minimum sites in there, new sites that that, that are empty that, that actually have the potential or have uh, that, that may be impacted by this new overlay within itself. That being said. That doesn't take away the power of the architectural review board or us to modify setbacks on this. We can say our setbacks are 20 feet from, from the lot line and that's our green space. That will be a buffer. We can do that. We have the power but to do that. The, the, you, that's not exactly correct. No, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. The, the buffer in the NC2 district right now is a mandatory 25 feet. No, 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 I'm just, I'm just talking about and, it in general. No, it's not, it's not, it's a weird setback in the, in the NC2 I, district. I, admit, I, admit, I, I, I understand that. I'm just talking about in general. We can, we, the board, the village board can change that at any time if that's what we want. You know, we control that. So one of the things that, you know, we did take away is the height uh, on this. Um, that's, that, that's exactly what we did. We didn't change anything else besides that. We said we we were moving this the, the height, an additional floor on this on this sector of Crown Avenue, not in the whole thing, but just on that sector. So my recollection was that the majority of the board agree with that concept. So I'm okay with that. Um, so I'm this is my ass. I'm okay with passing as much as. I have conflicts with some areas, but I'm okay with the concept of passing the comp plan the way it is. I am not okay, and thank you, Stuart, for clarifying this, and Jaime for clarifying this, the text amendment stuff, because uh, over the weekend when I was reading your memo or your email, and that's a conversation that, you know, the story you and I had, and, and I had that with Karen, is about parking and all these variables that, that, that are part of this and i think that needs to be studied as an overall picture not just as a very direct uh portion that we are we're targeting right now i want to call it on on this one so i think we should look into this and i think we should wrap it with the rest of the text amendment stuff that we're going to be doing anyway um so i think that makes sense uh for me at least i don't know how the rest of the board will feel but to me I want to look at parking, you know, the number of parking yeah. regulations within itself and as, as a big picture, not just as a micro section. I, of I, I, do want to, I do want to point out that you can do that. Uh, you have an EIS that covers what you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. You can go back and make other changes to 
other elements of the parking regulations and do that under a much smaller level of uh, review. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure that you can sort of say, hey, we're going to now take this new batch of things without looking at it all over again and going through a new EIS process. So I, that, 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 I, I wish I could, I, again, that's a conversation that, you know, we had a couple of weeks back with BHF uh, and Frank, and that, I wanted to include all that stuff, but it's not going to happen. So since that is not going to happen, I don't want this portion to stay away from the bigger picture that we need to address. Yeah, no, I only mean it to say that if your desire is to move forward with the text amendments, but with some changes, and then also have a new set of tax amendments that haven't been looked at before that I would just say that I think we need some time, me and Stuart and Lanius Council to figure out the mechanics of how that would work before you get too far away down the road. I don't want anyone leaving this conversation today thinking that that's definitely a simple thing to do because I, I, I don't think it is. Um, and I, I would need some time to confer with my colleagues to figure out the mechanics of that. Because if you say, well, we're gonna wait six months until we have a decision to make about all these other districts, we, we may reach a point where we have to do like an in-depth EIS process again to do the tech zone amendments. And I, I don't think that there's a desire to enter into a new huge environmental process when you could avoid it by doing just a small supplemental piece. And that's all I'm saying. I think I, I think you, you and I in, in store, I think we have to have a, an, an internal conversation because I need to understand that a little bit better on uh, that point. Because um, I definitely don't want to take away the momentum, but at the same time, I don't want to leave a gap. And for me right now, I, I feel that I'm leaving a gap if I say yes to this but I need to understand that better. And I don't want to take too much time on this meeting right now to understand that. So I, I rather just have an internal conversation. Uh, I invite any of all of my colleagues that wanted to be part of that conversation, but I need to understand that fully a hundred percent to that effect. Because as you guys know, um, you know, I want to look at parking in a different perspective as well. And, and by, by allowing this part of the tax amendment, I think I'll be going against what I what my beliefs are. So that's that's all I'm gonna have to say. I don't have, you know, problems again. This is you know, going back to the to the memo or the email that Stuart sent, you know, th there are some clarifications and thank you, Stuart, for actually reading all this stuff that sometimes we miss because I was looking at a bigger picture. But these are details, very small details that make a big difference and a big impact. If, we, if we're not careful. So I do appreciate Stuart for you looking into the small details. And I think I will agree with, we should stay with what we have right now and not make those changes um, that, that are here in some areas at least. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, I don't know if any of my colleagues has anything to say, but uh, please, uh, I will call you guys. I'll set up with Karen a, a call at some point, hopefully this week, maybe Friday afternoon or something or Monday at some point. So as I like to do when I so, sort of lose track of what we're discussing, which is what just happened for me, um, not ashamed to say it, <laughs> um, it's, it feels to me that instead of going roundabout and maybe trying to figure out what's being said, that maybe the three of you could discuss, put a paragraph or two in writing, and then just send it to us or present it at a if more appropriate at uh, the next meeting so that we're not all involved. I'm not sure that all of us are as um, hung up on this one point, unless I'm missing, I mean, I, mean I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not getting it. There's a difference. No, uh, so, yeah, no, so just, just really brief, Mayor. So obviously in here, and that, you know, on, on the first paragraph, I want to say that Stuart's and that talks about you know, parking and the, yep. the number of parking spaces that are yep. required for some of this. And as you know, I have said in the past that I want to look at this in a more uh, direct overall picture of, of what the village has, you know, making it a little bit more realistic to me, uh, more realistic in regards to, you know, is it one and a quarter parking spaces 
or is actually two parking spaces that we require? Do we require visitor parking spaces? So by us keeping the way we have it here, to me, it will be a contradiction of what we should be accomplishing. Because if we, in six months from now, like Jaime said, if we're going to change that, all this is going to change again. So I'd rather just kind of hold off on some of this if possible. But if not, then, you know, we just move on, we'll move on and we go from there at that point. But I need to understand this a little bit better. So, so you're you not happy with the ratios of the allotments of parking for the square feet and all the delineations. That, correct. Um, is, well, that's, that's, part, what, that's part of what we have already. You know, Understood. I'm not happy with what we have. So that's why, but, but because you, these you are thought the comprehensive plan should actually fix it in one direction. It may have done in a different direction. Right. So you still are not comfortable enough to say yay on the comprehensive plan as is. is no, 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 not, not in the whole comprehensive plan. What I'm talking about is the, just this the amendments that we have to make. I meant to say that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I didn't mean, no. I, sh I should not have said it that way. Yes. I, I want to like, I want to note this here because I know we're going to enter a phase where we're talking about parking minimums and requirements and so on and so forth. Um, you know, and I haven't been here obviously as long as, as everybody else on this call, but um, in the short time that I have been here, some of the places that I've seen the biggest challenges are places that are, uh, you know, they've been around for a while and they're non-conforming. So there's a property on Croton Avenue that's, I think it was built in the fifties. Uh, they came in, they wanted to add five more units to their project. And so when we, when we got an opportunity to take a look at what was happening on the site, we found that it actually was already, uh, it wanted to add these units, but it was already short 30 spaces out of, you know, a, a required, you know, 100 and, 100 and some odd spaces, right? And so part of the problem that they have is that issue. Uh, there are places like Avalon and Harbor Square, which are new and came in under those new parking ratios, and they... Um, as far as I can tell, don't have parking problems. So those parking ratios, some of those numbers that you talk about, um, really don't have those problems. There are other places like downtown um, properties, like the uh, the Stag property that you know had parking waivers, I believe, associated with it. Did not provide the parking that it was required to park uh, to, to 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 provide. And so the issue isn't that it had a minimum. The issue is that it didn't even meet those ratios that it had before. And so I just want to say that, you know, certainly you should look at all these parking standards and make sure they're sized correctly. There are places like, you know, the S75 zone and the T zone that if you wanted to put in a new, you know, one or two family home, it could have four or five or six or seven apartment uh, bedrooms in it. And you still only have to provide two spaces. That's probably not right, right? That's probably not the correct number of spaces. Uh, you know, if you have a one bedroom, you need less than you do than if you have a two bedroom or three bedroom, four bedroom. We should have something that escalates similar to what we have in other districts. But I, 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 want, to, I want to say this because I think that in my experience, the parking problems that we have are not because people are providing uh, insufficient parking because the code doesn't require them to necessarily, because they're not providing any at all or anywhere near what they're supposed to provide. Uh, and, I, and that's just my general experience. And so I say that because there are a lot of areas that need more parking. Uh, the S75, the T zone, those areas need to have their parking minimums looked at a little closer. And they're not ones that have this escalating thing where you only have to provide one or one and a half or two. Um, the areas that have, have, have seen that parking minimum used uh, are places like Harbor Square and Avalon. I've yeah, never heard anybody complaining yeah. about Avalon not having enough parking. Uh, that's not the kind of true, but no, I'm not going to get into that discussion heard. right now. <laughs> you know, but you know, that's that's not not here and there right now at this point. You know, again, I, I don't want to go back and just become this this whole parking conversation show because it's not. This is about the comp plan and some of the amendments, uh, zoning change amendments on this. So I'm gonna again, I'm gonna ask to have an internal meeting, an external discussion for me to understand this better. What what that means. Um, and in regards to this, uh, maybe it, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Maybe I, I am missing something. I, I do not disagree with you, Jaime, in regards to parking and what does that look like. But how many one families or how many two families do you get in a block? In the meantime, when you get these big buildings, these big developers like Avalon or like Harvest Square or like 
you know, had some crests, had some steps, um, you know, even though they're not getting bills, some of them. Uh, but, you know, how many of those do we get that has a bigger impact than a one family in, in a block or two blocks? You know, that's the effect that we are, that I'm talking about. That's the effect that we, at least, I think some of our more members have made that clear that if something's missing, sure, uh, in regards to parking. Um, you know, I know we have a consultant that is actually bringing some of this, um, some of this stuff on some recommendations in regards to, um, and that's because I had asked to look, for them to look into this as well. And that's something that the board internally has spoken to before, start getting rid of the waivers and actually have a fee for parking instead of a waiver, which is a free stall for a developer. Uh, that's something that again, it's going to be part of a tax amendment that we have to do to go through this. So is all these little pieces that are here and here and here and here that affect that this whole process about parking. So I want to make sure that I'm clear for me, at least for me, you know, if we can have this, if by next week we have a meeting between now and next Wednesday, you know, I'll be, I'll, and, 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 and I'm okay. I'm okay with that. You know, but again, I want to make sure I, I understand. And this is probably just me. I don't know if the rest of the board feels the same way, but it's just probably me. Most of the time, 90% of the time, it's just me. The, um, oh, I think it is. I think we've already had this conversation, so I'm not sure we need to rehash unless somebody has something new to say. It feels out of the hundreds of things that we looked at in the 10 or 11 chapters of all the work, we have this one piece left, unless I'm missing something, it feels like this is the last of the conversations. That's what it feels like to me. And Jaime, I'm happy to have the conversation with you, but I would actually say that I'm disheartened that actually the more recent development and the large development also, and I said this last time, starts us in the hole. Um, there's no visitor parkings, there's no account. I mean, so we have on both sides of a bell curve. We have on the very small homes, old homes that were built for a family that expanded and expanded and expanded with families, whether there are too many families living in them now or the right number of families. I'm not having that discussion. It's simply not enough based on the age of that and then the new ones in the last 10 years avalon um i won't discuss but westerly for sure and the amount of parking spaces they then take up in um the commuter and the restaurant their employees alone cover it um open door ball property at two church so now we alleviated some of the parking but it goes on and on and on so we can talk about it all we want and make this a parking but it feels to me on the big picture this is the last piece um, Stuart has got that look on his face that says to me, no, I mentioned three or four things you guys have honed in on only once. I want to move on to make sure Stuart got his answers. And I don't mind, you know, one more conversation. Um, I already had, I'm not going to repeat everything I've said before about, but I think we're on this last piece. So we figure this out. We make a recommendation. Stuart, what other items in, I read it again. Yeah. I, I, Actually, Mayor, uh, what, what other items do we need the, to address tonight? The, the only what, what, what I'm really looking for is I think we I think there appears to be a consensus of the board with regard to the comprehensive plan. That resolution will be done. The finding statement that resolution will be done. I just want to know from the board in terms of the zoning changes, which are the setbacks, the driveway setback and the overlay districts is the board comfortable with the proposals for those three specific changes so that the board would be prepared to adopt those changes on the 7th of July. That's, that's really what I was, I, that, that was my whole purpose to tr just try to figure that out. So that when I am drafting the resolutions, I know specifically what I'm drafting. Okay. And I may have missed it, but it sounds like Stuart wants three things. And one of the items is where we stopped. The other two seem to be okay. Right. Somebody better raise their voices now if I'm misunderstanding. So with the question on one of them, if obviously we're, I, I believe a majority of us are quite okay with the other two, with the setbacks and the driveway. It was the the other one with the uh, overlay, right? Correct. Is that the one we were? 
Is that one of the ones? That's that where you stopped. Choice so were you sort of a little overlay. bit stuck on? That's how I read it too, Bob. I'm but just I believe, confirming. I, I believe we all agreed that we didn't want the upper level. And that's all that would affect that part of that overlay. And then downtown would be accepted if we grant that level. That's right. If you granted the the, uh, the density bonus, that is correct. Right. So the only thing that would change in the Croton Avenue overlay would be the height. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think that, so, you know, it's, it is, uh, I'm glad that Stuart corrected that issue. Um, it was certainly, there was an extra story and that was removed. So um, it is supposed to be three stories, not changing from what it is now. I do think, and I know that um, Trustee Casada mentioned that you may want to, you'd be okay not doing the, the Croton Avenue overlay at all. I do think that there's value in passing the Croton Avenue overlay. I, I want to say that I, it's not as strong as an incentive, but I do think that there is. Still no, value. but that's, that's what you sort of said. If we, if that's not in the, you know, if we don't have that for floor, I, I thought, forgive me if I, if I misunderstood yeah, it, I, like there's no really a point to have an overlay in that section. I believe that's what you, you said. So that's what I said. I have no problem with that at all because we can, and that's when I said, we can create setbacks and we can do the guidelines because that's what we do. So look, if that's the only, if that's the only set, you know, those are the three things that we're looking for. I'm okay with those things, eliminating the, the additional floor in the Crone Avenue section. I'm okay with everything else as well. And, and that, and what will, the only change that I will make is that in, where it says maximum building height with density bonus in the Croton Avenue overlay, where it now says none, which was what they, they put in, I would simply put that it's three stories or 36 feet, which is now what is the requirement mm -hmm. so that it simply makes it clear. So if that's, if, if the board is okay with that, uh, then, uh, you know, then, then this, then this, this can proceed. And uh, Trustee Gazzotta, I'll be happy to, you know, have that call with you with regard to the other issues that, you know, you raised there. Uh, otherwise, you know, as I said, this could then, uh, you know, proceed on the seventh, uh, uh, unless there's any other views from. Uh, I think Bob, Bob uh, well, was would, trying would to the, say something. Yeah, would the density bonus come into play if we don't have the additional height? That's what they no. just said. No, yeah, not so, not, in, not in the Croton Avenue. Right. There, there so, is, so it shouldn't be the density bonus shouldn't be in that paragraph. That it should just be a maximum height of boom. Well, what, well, what I, what I, that's right. Because, that's what Manny just said. Right, because the footnote for this chart says, and this is where I wrote the note to Simon, it says a density bonus may be granted to permit additional building height up to the maximum shown. So I think it should be changed that a density bonus would only be granted within the downtown overlay district. Correct. Uh, so that that seems to be the, the consensus of the board. So that way, uh, there will be no question that in the Croton Avenue overlay, there is no density bonus to be granted. If the board is okay with that, I can make that change. I'm okay with that. Okay. We're going with the majority here. So is everybody going like this? Okay. All righty. Then, then Mayor. Will, Thank you, sir. I'm good for this. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Madam Manager. Okay, next up, um, our uh, building inspector, Joe Gustinelli, uh, has worked out some recommendations for fire inspections, uh, the process and the fees. And uh, he's put a lot of effort into this and it's something um, that we've uh, been able to do proactively on buildings um, that are three units or more and commercial buildings. And I would like to turn this over to Joe so he can explain to you his work and uh, we can have a conversation about how to make that program more effective. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hello, Always nice evening. to see you. Good evening to everyone. Um, I'm just uh, here tonight basically to propose a change in the fee schedule regarding the fire inspections. Uh, currently, our fee schedule um, charges $115 uh, to be collected prior to performing the inspection. Um, we think is basically an ineffective way of accomplishing what the intent of the fire inspection is. Um, we don't want to not perform a fire inspection um, just because a building owner hasn't paid uh, a required fee that's on the schedule. Um, so uh, we wanted to change the fee schedule to now be where uh, we perform it as a service. Um, there would be no charge for the initial inspection and a one follow-up inspection. 
So if the building owner gets a list of some items that they need to correct, they're given a lot of time, uh, say two weeks to correct it. And if they do so, um, we have a safe building inspected for the occupants of the building. Um, the owner has no charge incurred for it. We perform the service. Um, but if we go back uh, for a third inspection or subsequent inspections, um, they would be charged a $500 fee for each administ administrative fee for each inspection after um, for uh, a number of reasons. One is because um, each time that we'd have to go back, rather than being able to schedule an inspection for another building, um, we'd have to come back to reinspect uh, a building that a uh, building owner is just not uh, bringing into compliance. Um, and therefore, it's a cost to the village uh, to constantly have an inspector go out uh, and do a three, four, five inspections to get compliance. Um, so we, we would charge the building owner for those inspections only when we get to the third one and after. Um, this would actually, you know, encourage that the building owner um, brings the building into compliance in a timely manner with no cost to them whatsoever. But those that uh, choose not to do it within a reasonable amount of time would start um, having to pay fees uh, for services for, for us to constantly go back and have to recheck the building, you know, third and fourth and fifth time. Um, so, you know, we, we don't want uh, an inspection not to occur because they're on the fee schedule the way it is right now, we're required to collect the fee. We want to encourage to be able to just, you know, to basically schedule the inspection, perform the fire inspection, make sure that it's safe. And um, and I think in this, this manner it would actually um, encourage the owners to, they would have a reason to want to bring the building into compliance quickly in one or two inspections, since they would not be paying any fee to do so. And those that choose not to will then be just charged those fees for not bringing the building in compliance and, and, and making it safe for the occupants. If I may, there's no link on here. So what we're hearing today, the fee change schedule change is about not charging for the first, it's like three strikes and you're out. So the first two, you're good. The third one, you're not. That's the change you're discussing when we're discussing a fee change schedule. Is that what we're here to do tonight? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So there's no actual fees being presented. It's the same fees, just a different mode of operation, if you will. Well, the fee right now for the initial inspection is $115. What is it for the second? There isn't any. It's $115. And, and, and for $115, we can be inspecting three, four, five, six times. Okay. So there, there's really no, um, is no encouraging of the property owner to bring the building to compliance to paying $115 and getting an unlimited amount of times that we're going back uh, to try to follow up on them. Okay, so now it'll be free number one, free number two, 115 for number three. Well, actually we, we have on the schedule that by the third one, the fee would be $500. Oh, I, I'm, I, there's no link on, on the, so I didn't see that, I'm sorry. Did you send something around and I just totally missed it with the fee? Maddie's yeah, going we, like we, this, so that means I, yes, yeah. I missed it, okay. Yes, we did. So the third one is 500 and then after that, let's say four, five, six, does it keep going up? What happens? It would be, you'd be charged another $500 fee for the fourth. That's, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot. So by then you should start really doing the math. Okay. All right, just sorry, must've missed well, it. It would, be, it, would, it would be an incentive to have the building on and bring it into compliance because they wouldn't, they wouldn't be incurring charges that could be a thousand, two thousand dollars for not bringing bringing the building up to the proper fire safety. Okay. If you're able to do it in two inspections, there would be no cost to the building owner. They would just have it in compliance, with, which is what we want. And there would be no cost to them with, at all. Okay. That's the presentation, right? That's correct. Okay. Comments? I'm okay with that. All right. Okay, anybody? I'm looking around the gallery. I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, so let me tell you that at 30,000 feet, I love these ideas. I want to do more of these type of things. I'm a big believer in amnesty programs, all this sort of stuff, all the stuff that says, please do, 
what's good for community. Don't make people work two, three times to get the same thing done they could have done the first time. And therefore, other things don't get done. Time has a double, it's a geometric value. It's the value of the time you go out and the value of not going out to do something else at the same time. So it has a doubling effect when people waste someone's time or take someone's time. It's not necessarily a waste. It's something that they have to do. So I think that in theory, this is exactly like you said, Joe. This is the action we want people to take. Please use us. Do it for free. And we'll give you a second one for free if maybe we didn't catch something or you needed to take care of something. My only concern is that I know that's not your job is communicating this. So one of the downfalls that we keep hearing about is communication. And I am been doing communications for a long, long, long time. And Karen and I speak about this all the time. It's either too much or too little or not enough or not the right. I mean, it's very difficult to get it right. I would argue that if we get communications right, we wouldn't have a 50% divorce rate in the United States. It's a tough gig. Having said that, this is a thing that really should be explained and really brought home and, and not just in some dry letter because the idea here is, hey, folks, come on. Not charging you anything, just get it fixed, please. And let us move on to other issues. Um, take advantage of us, please. Um, I think the idea is right. I never know whether it's 500, 300. I mean, what do I know what the right number is? You know, 500 sounds like a lot of money, but you get two for free. So, you know, I was in retail, sounds good. I'll take that, you know, and other. So I leave it to you. Um, but I really do think the communication has to be really strong on this and we should spend a little time and money on the communication and tell people to please, is there a time limit or are you just asking for this to be going forward the way we do things? Like, is there, hey, this is a 2122 special and after that it's over or is it just, let's see how this goes and then get back to it? So Mayor, can we just piggyback on that one uh, for a minute? And Joe, um, Prior to now, prior to pre-pandemic, -pre sure. Um, when you send out, how do you usually do inspections in a three-family and up uh, or commercial spaces? You usually send out a letter telling them, "Look, we're going to be doing. We need to do an inspection of your property. Please let us know." Blah blah blah. You know, what is your availability? Is that something along those lines that you guys do? Yeah, we we send out a notice to the building owner or to the management property management uh, company about three weeks prior to when we want to do the inspection, and we, in the letter it says that uh, we would like to schedule an inspection and we give them the date um, and ask them to com to confirm back that they received it and that they're aware that that's the date we're going to be there because we understand that you have you have multiple apartments you have to organize that with the uh, tenants. So uh, let me so let me ask you this: How many letters of those do you? Because I obviously there's buildings, obviously there's just only one letter to the owner, so he, and then he needs to provide access to to those apartments at that point. But how many letters do you usually send out, and when do you send these out? The reason why I'm asking is because I want to piggyback on what the mayor said. Maybe when when you start sending these letters, you attach this new information in those letters and explaining to them exactly what that is, because it only affects, it doesn't affect from people that have a one and two family. It affects people that have commercial businesses and three families and up. That's the, that's the part of the community that this is gonna affect. So maybe that's the, that's, you know, how often do you send these, these letters out? I mean, at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, quarter no, of the year? What we do is we choose like an area, like if we're doing now um, uh, the area of all the, all the uh, two, three family and up on uh, South Highland, we'll get a list of all the parcels of that street and we'll send them all out um, scheduling um, inspections, you know, for the next say couple of weeks till we get, depending on the number of parcels we have to accomplish and get done. Um, but yes, with, with exactly what you're saying, um, with, if we were putting in, this is the new fee schedule, we would attach all that information with the letter so they'd be aware before we get there that obviously there's no cost to you for the initial one um, and, and spell it out that, you know, a follow-up one would also be done as part of the service. And then if after that, the third one, fourth one, fifth one, should there be any, this would be the fee that would be required to be paid. I think that, at least to me, you know, it will be helpful because after that, you know, it's, it's, it's part of their responsibility because you did get the letter, you did make the appointment, and now, you know, you're liable if, if you have a third or fourth 
you know, visit by the building inspector or by the code enforcement at this point. You know, so they, they, they are aware of that. So I think that's the part that I think, I hope, Mayor, I'm not speaking out of turn, but I think that's the, the education tool that I think we can convey to, to the homeowners at this point. At least one, at least one of many, because, you know, Karen and I and you, we've been talking about bigger pictures and, you know, other stuff that I would love to do as well. Okay. Um, hearing like that we've covered the bases. It would be nice, Karen, if six months into this, we got just an update. Hey, we send out 48, you know, 29 responded and it worked. We want to make adjustments. It would be nice to have that, whether in writing or in a meeting. You know, I don't want to give you guys more work. That's It's nice. The, the metrics are good. Yeah, I mean, you like know, something metric. simple. So, um, great. Listen, Joe, I think I think it's the right it's the right feeling. It's the right thing to do. We should be doing more of these, you know, to get people to do certain things, not charge them all the time for everything, but then say, okay, at the end, like you got to play with us. Otherwise, you know, uh, we got to go for the three strike concept. Okay. Baseball season opened up. I'm into the baseball stuff. It's supposed to be at a game tonight, folks. Um, so Joe, anything else going once, oh, I, going I, twice? I, I, no, I think, Mayor, you, um, the way you explained it is exactly the intent of this, is to, to try to, you know, uh, do a service for the purpose of making buildings safe, giving the uh, building owner the opportunity to get it done on a timely manner. And obviously, if we do the follow-up inspection, uh, which is also no cost to them, we give them the adequate time to get the building into compliance, say, two or three weeks. But then if we come back in two or three weeks and you haven't accomplished anything at that point, you know, you're going to be responsible to pay right. to get it done. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Joe. Thank Have you. a wonderful rest of the evening. Um, I don't think you're speaking anymore, right? Nope. Okay. Karen, we're back to you. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, one more thing tonight. Um, so applying for credit card, uh, applying I'm sorry, accepting, I'm reading wrong, accepting credit cards online. So this is something we're trying to do. Are we skipping Amora. credit card transaction fees and going to accepting oh, credit I'm card Oh, I'm sorry, payments? you're right, I did skip. Them. Are we combining them? I don't know. I think we can combine them. So I think that that these are- um, No, Maddie's easy. going, no, we can't combine them. I love well, Zoom. We I can see everybody, I, you know, in real live meetings, I have to really run my head okay. here. So we I think we should stay with credit card credit transaction card fees. fees. <laughs> we will maybe I should put my glasses on and that would be more helpful. And there so we go. That, that's there, the problem is solved. Um, credit card transaction fees are first, but they will be followed, not, not combined with a discussion on credit card payments and, and payments via the internet. They're, they're two very related, yet not joined issues. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Maddie to talk about some of the things we've learned about that we didn't know before about accepting uh, credit card payments online. Okay. I, I know this you. is going to be a super exciting it is. You, it okay. is. words right out of my mouth. Um, thank you, okay. uh, Karen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm joined this evening by uh, our treasurer, Dale Brennan, uh, who's going to back me up on some of this information. But I'm going to start by saying this is uh, but an introduction to a very exciting conversation that we're looking forward to bringing to you at the next work session uh, on July 14th, when Chief Sylvester and I will be here to introduce uh, live and in color our new mobile payment app for metered parking spaces in the village. Um, so this is a project that we've been working on for quite some time. And during the research component, um, this topic of credit card transaction fees uh, has come up. So um, Dale, I'm, I'm going to sort of, you know, go through this and then you'll you'll flag me if, if I miss something or, or uh, get it wrong. Um, so in the village, uh, typically the, the longstanding policy has been um, that when you uh, purchase something with a credit card, the credit card transaction fees are attributed to the person making the purchase. So for example, if you come in and you buy a license, if you're paying your water bill, if you're paying your taxes, the uh, credit card fee that's charged to the village is not something that the village absorbs. They pass it along to you so that you're responsible for the entire uh, freight of the transaction. So looking into um, how this applies to the uh, mobile payment app for parking spots, um, we learned that many communities were in fact absorbing the credit card fee on these transactions. So it's typically about 25 cents per transaction because you know people are parking for an hour or two to the tune of maybe $2 at the very most um, and paying uh, 25 cent 
per transaction is what the municipalities are willing to absorb in order to incentivize the use of that app. Um, and so why would they do that? Well, they would do that because they're trying to, um, to the extent possible, dissuade people from using quarters. Um, we have uh, parking enforcement staff um, who spend um, you know, at least a couple hours a week, I'm sure, em uh, emptying the coin containers, replacing them with an empty one, uh, bringing it uh, in for a deposit, um, as well as uh, doing little site repairs on, on the coin operated meters. Um, so the, the fewer quarters, um, you know, typically the, the less uh, time they would need to spend uh, doing that. Um, also, using a mobile payment app uh, would give the village um, a lot more information, um, not necessarily about the drivers or, or you know, the, the parkers themselves, um, but what areas of the village um, are seeing shorter or longer term parking sessions. Right now, we don't have any of that data because all we know is that the meter fills up with quarters and then at the end of the day, we, we empty it. Um, so the, the question um, for the Board of Trustees um, is, how would you like us to proceed uh, with the vendor that we choose? Um, there are two options. One is to bundle the convenience fee with the credit card transaction fee. So no matter what happens, when someone goes to pay for a parking spot through an app, they're gonna pay slightly more than they would pay if they were using quarters. That's just a, a fact of life. Um, it can be as, as little as 11 cents or as much as um, 25 cents. Um, so we could bundle that um, and have the, the person who's parking pay the entire thing, the credit card transaction fee and the convenience fee. Alternatively, we could absorb the credit card transaction fee and have the driver just pay the convenience fee, um, which again would probably be you know, a, about a quarter depending on which vendor we, we end up signing a contract with. Um, in speaking with some of the vendors and in our neighboring communities, uh, communities that have uh, five or six times more uh, metered spots than we do, see about 5,000 transactions a month. So if the village uh, had 1,000 transactions a month at, at 25 cents a pop, uh, we'd be talking about $6,000 a year um, in credit card fees that, that would potentially be absorbed. The difficulty is since we've never had a parking app before, we really don't know what the landscape is gonna look like. We don't know how many people are going to be eager to use this. So it's a little difficult to understand what the revenue shortfall might be, um, but we do believe that it would increase compliance and it would certainly help um, at least to, a, to an extent our parking enforcement officers to make better use of their time by enforcing parking uh, rather than uh, dealing with the meters. Um, so we come to you um, asking uh, principally which direction you'd like us to go here. Um, and Dale, please uh, jump in if there's anything that I missed there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good evening. No, I think uh, Maddie, you, you portrayed it perfectly. So it, it really is a, a, a board decision, uh, you know, manager's decision, which way we want to go. So um, thank you, Dale. So there's a, a bunch of transaction fees involved in all transaction fees. There are usually um, the vendor, right, that you hire for this. There's the bank that processes at one end. There's, there's, there's two ends in the middle, the vendors in the middle, and then there is and every time you do a refund, it goes back the other way. So every time you think you're really doing three and a half percent, it's really like four, four and a half percent. I'm assuming you did all the calculations. I'm assuming that um, you also looked at what we discussed when we went forward with this project is that this is supposed to generate incremental revenue in the long run. And that's still the case. So this conversation, this particular question is, um, is it a choice between vendors? No, it's the same vendor asking, do you want to go on in the fork in the road, do you want to go to the right or to the left? The right being one option one, and then there's option two, and we just heard what that is. Um, do we get to change? In other words, I'm using the retail model while we're all learning together and while we're changing behavior of people, and when we will get some people who don't have this or they don't have that, and what do you mean you took the quarters away? Because I like to eliminate all coins. There's no reason to have coins at all, period, end of conversation. So, but but there are issues with that. There are some people that don't have um, mobile phones or uh, know how to do apps and et cetera, et cetera. So we'll get, to, you know, I don't think you make policy for 5%. You try to make policy for 85%, 95%, et cetera, and then find a way to manage the 5% or the 10%. So my question is, 
if, if I'm right about all that, the question is, could you do free for year one and then, and then learn from year one? Okay, we have 4,000 uses, not 1,000 that we thought. We have 500, not 1,000. And play around a little bit, both on our end, right? The vendor that we've never done anything like this with and learn what's because we'll make mistakes and, and you don't want to charge people when you're making mistakes and the consumer who will be making mistake and costing us more time. By the time we all finish learning, maybe it's 12 months and then we announce 30 days be before the 12 months. So can we change what we're doing? Is there enough tailoring or do we now tonight have to say, hey, yeah, let's go with plan A or plan B? My sense is that, you know, of course, they're going to be asking for a, a service agreement. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the number that they're looking for is three years. Um, we, okay. I mean, so long as the vendor is, is getting their, their end covered, I don't really think they mind if it comes from the village or, or you know, from the driver. Um, so my guess would be that, yes, if in fact a year in, we said, look, we've been absorbing these fees, it's not working out well for us, we need to pass it along. The only downside to that is going to be someone who goes uh, to park in the village every day used to pay a quarter. Now they pay 32 cents. Um, yeah. I'm so going to just correct you about one thing because I'm. Uh, it's really important to me that intent is recognized. The intention here is not we didn't get it right. It's exactly the opposite. Instead of working on theory, let's work in partnership, vendor, consumer, village to get it right. Because right now we don't know anything. We just know what other villages have. We're all in this. We're all going to figure these things out together and we're going to absorb the learning curve, the, the cost of the learning curve on the village side. But at some point be, be noted that we expect 12 months, 13, 14, it doesn't matter to me that once we understand the path, we then, well, so people understand where we're heading with this. Oh, Mayor, we lost you for just a moment there. Rika, you uh, got muted by mistake, I think. Yeah, it's on my little thing. As long as we um, have an understanding, Maddie, but the intention is exactly the opposite. I don't want the consumer to pay for errors or for the learning curve. I want the village, in my opinion, one vote. The village should take the time to get it right. So should the vendor invest in their time. We shouldn't sit here, the five of us, and sort of guess. whether. It's, it's, uh, my question is, are they flexible enough that they could do what I described? Because then it's a win-win-win for everybody. Um, I can't guarantee it, but I don't see any reason why they would not be. Uh, and okay. I can confirm that, um, you know, by tomorrow morning, I'm sure. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Um, comments from others? I can go. Uh, thank you, Maddie, for the presentation. So one question that I have is, um, I know that at the clerk's office, I the credit card transaction fee is paid by the consumer. Is that for a legal reason or is that an administrative reason? Do you know, can you speak to that and like how that would speak? Because now if we, if we go in the direction that the mayor is suggesting, then folks are gonna have different experiences with different parts of the village. Do you have any insights there? I think that's Dale's that question. Yeah, I, I think that's that's how we got to, to you this evening, right? Because this would certainly be a, a pivot in, in how the village has been operating. So I'll let uh, Dale and, and maybe Stuart chime in on that. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll start and then we can throw it to, to Stuart. When we uh, first were allowed to accept credit cards um, as a governmental agency, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we were not able to uh, absorb the credit card fee we actually had to pass it on to the consumer. This um, change has come about, you know, in, in recent years. But I think in terms of, say, for a water bill or a tax bill, it's an economy of scale. You know, you're not looking at a, a 75 cent transaction. You're looking at a thousand dollars or more transaction or, you know, or in the hundreds, you know, depending on the, you know, say for the clerk's office. You know, if someone's buying a, a station parking, you know, that's, again, you know, a higher uh, dollar value. And, and initially, in, in terms of uh, the government not uh, paying for the credit card fee, it was basically seen as uh, that cost is then being spread out essentially over all the taxpayers. So it, it made sense to, to just keep it um, separate that each transaction was paid for, you know, in whole by the, the, the resident or the consumer. 
and, and the policy there isn't changing in the clerk's office. They're they're still going to do what they're they're doing. This is just on the parking side. Correct. But on one end, being a consumer, we're saying at the clerk's office that it's a convenience fee. Yet we want to absorb that convenience fee when it comes to parking. So it kind of sends a mixed message in me. I'm I'm on board with what everything's being said, but I'm just being that consumer right now. Yeah, I, I just want to point out also, you know, the, the vendor that with whom we've been working most closely, the the differentiation between the village absorbing part or none um, is less than 10 cents. Um, you know, this is this is not a sizable amount of money, um, but certainly as this becomes more popular um, and, and more widely used, if we want to start thinking about uh, creative ways to uh, differently use other types of parking in our village, um, you know, 10 cents at a, at a time could could certainly add up. So it, it is something that, you know, we wanted to bring to the board um, and, and ask you all to consider because, you know, it, it's it doesn't seem like a lot um, and it, it really is not a lot um, to the individual consumer um, if they have to pay 10 cents more than they otherwise would. Um, and it is still optional. So if someone said, I don't want anything to do with this app, they can they can still use quarters. Um, you know, that this isn't a mandatory uh, surcharge. Um, but, you know, we, we did just want to bring it to your attention for exactly the reason that Trustee Fritch, you just identified. Yeah. Okay. Well, my take is I, I, agree with the mayor in wanting in with these kinds of things i tend to just like bob just said go with what the, what would be best for the consumer in this case the um a resident of the village or whomever is using the it doesn't have to be a resident whomever is using the the app the challenge is uh that and this is where dale maybe you can illuminate can you give me a sense of what the scale might look like of what the cost might be to the village in future years at maximum capacity? Like what are we actually talking about? Uh, I think I think the issue um, with that is we, we really do not have any data in order to make a projection. Um, so, you know, I, I could give you a number, but I have nothing to back it up. Well, do we know um, how, how many, how many um, meters do we have? We have fewer than 300. Um, and most of the communities who are near us that have 5,000 transactions a month are well over 1,200 meters. Um, so okay. you know, ostensibly, there, there would not be a time that we would be over 1,000. Um, but, you know, we, we can't promise that. It, it could, you know, take off like wildfire and people could be, you know, using the, the meters for a half an hour at a time and, and we could see huge volumes. It's, it's sort of impossible to know uh, based on the data we have today, which is very little. Right. So, um I uh, and if you could do the the mental math here, Dale. I uh, so if let's say let's say it's three hundred. Let's say we have three hundred. I know we have, you said fewer than. Well, let's be conservative. Let's say we have three hundred meters. Um, and I know that there's a limit to how much you know there was what I don't know an hour. What is the, there's only so many. If, if if I were to go to the meter and refill it all like twenty four hours a day, there's a certain amount. There's a certain limit. Right. What is the what is the limit that I can use? Uh, one person can use a, a meter. Maybe that's not the right question. But what is the, the 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 limit that each meter functionally can take? Is there a limit, or or is the time like incremental? Like I can do like ten minutes. So in in terms of paid time, the the smallest amount you can pay for is fifteen minutes. Okay. Um, okay. If, if that's helpful, there are some meters that accept up to two hours at a time. There are some that are only an hour. Some that are half hour. Some that are fifteen minutes. Okay. Got. It. So 15 minutes, so uh, that's 15 minutes uh, times four for an hour, uh, times 24, where am I at, Dale? 24 times four, who's got it? It's actually, it's, it's 20 minutes. You get 20 minutes per quarter, so. Okay, so yeah. 20, so you, uh, okay, my calculation is a little bit off. But that, that, so you, you're trying to get a sense of like, if like at maximum, if you were to do like 20 minutes uh, times however many times if you were to buy 24 hours by 20 minutes, whatever that number is, then multiply it by the number of meters. That's the number, that's the maximum number that we would possibly pay per day. That's the upper limit. And then you say, okay, so then let's take that and put it across 365 days a year. Mathematically, the highest that village could possibly pay is then are, are we talking like $30,000 a year, $2,000 a year, a hundred thousand dollars. I'm trying to get a sense of scale because if we're saying like, well, like mathematically, if you were to do that and just have every meter filled every 20 minutes for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you're looking at $250,000. Uh, that's at the absolute maximum. 
then I would say, okay, so that gives us a sense of what the scale is. And I would totally be on board with what the mayor is saying of saying, let's give it 12, 12 months, 18 months, whatever it is, uh, to, to get a sense of how usage is going. And if we can give ourselves uh, a, a benchmark to say, we're not looking as a village to kick in more than like, 20k or 100k or whatever and after 12 months we go well like we're nowhere near that let's keep the party going and then just revisit it later on and then we as you're giving us updates dale you can say we're getting near that benchmark that you gave of you don't want to spend more than a hundred thousand dollars whatever it is and then we can talk about okay let's make the switch the reason that i think that making the switch although it's painful no no consumer wants to have these added expenses the uh, a lot of folks uh, have been used to uh, now if you're ordering food uh, using apps like you're paying not only for the delivery fee, but there's also uh, that you're paying the app, Seamless or Grubhub or whatever for the for the service. And so if we say like, okay, like we've been doing this for a year, a year and a half, two years, it's going really great. Actually, so many people are using it that now we're running into the situation where we reached how much we think is reasonable for the village to pay. We're looking to, to transfer it over and, and what it means for you instead of 25 cents, you're paying like 32 and uh, each time that you're doing it. I think that that's, that's feasible. I think it's reasonable. Um, and so that's where I am. I uh, just, just quick math. I came, I don't know if Dale was, I saw her scratch in there. I came up with 32,000. I figured 900 clicks for 300 meters per hour. The meters oh, are no. only in operation for nine hours a day, six days a week. All right. So that's times nine then. My bad. The plot thickens. It's even less time. <laughs> it is. That's so, what I was trying to say before. It's not always. Uh, right. So it's it comes out. A day, seven days a week. Right. So it comes out to 295. Um, does that did you come up near that dale i'm um, in that neighborhood uh i was somewhere in that neighborhood yeah, yeah. so just out of curiosity um what uh, and i don't need exact numbers but the credit card fees that we are charging the amount what is the revenue on it now that comes to us correct or that goes no, to the credit card company. okay so that's a pass through so do we have a, a an estimated number of what how many of those we do in 12 months or when I <clears throat> actually I looked at our taxes and water um, credit cards for a year um, and the majority of payments we receive online are not by credit card they the majority so, is by e-check e yep. yes um, but in in terms of credit card fees uh, that were um, paid directly actually to the credit card. We're not even a pass through. We, we don't even receive the money. It, it goes directly to, uh. to, to the credit card company. Um, it was $10,000 um, for uh, last year. That's peanuts compared to these meters. Yeah, the reason I think they're bringing it up aside from the obvious is when we were told about this project slash program, there was a revenue conversation of, of why we're doing it, that there was. And, and actually the downside is that we're so small, not that we're so big, but that we're so small. And it, because startup costs and light and all that, and, and all the other costs when you're so small is actually um, not so valuable as the bigger players. And, and so to approve this, we talked about the revenue, how it would pay for itself in next number of months, blah, 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 blah. I can go through the whole thing. Made perfect sense. What they're saying now is not a loss of money. What they're saying now is you now, that revenue we told you about that we think we're gonna get, it's gonna be X thousands less because of this. Therefore, the, the premise of why we approved it um, is being discussed as well. Um, and, and, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think in the long term, these meters have got to go for, I mean, I don't even think Maddie named all the reasons. You know, they break, they're, they're annoying, they're, they don't work. Should I park here because it's broken? Is it legal? Will I get it? I mean, it's not good for consumers. It's not good for us. People have complained about it. Um, the parts, the people, I, I mean, it goes on and on. Um, but I think we're having conversation uh, not only about the dolls, but that what the promised um, initiative was is now decreased because of this scenario. But I do think you need benchmarks, especially when it comes to money and making decisions. Otherwise, it's all a theoretical conversation, sort of like the three minutes I just spoke about meters. Like, these are things I hear, but I don't really know. But we will know. And we can even speak to the vendor and say, okay, now we know where we are. Um, so it's a, and that's why I think you need a benchmark. But I think your numbers, Bob, and your numbers, Omar and Dale, we're going to find out they're probably pretty accurate. Um, 
at the worst case scenario, but I think the staff is basically saying, listen, we told you revenues are up here. Eh, they're probably, are you okay with that? Is the way I'm hearing it anyway. Um, yeah. I, I'm okay with it. I think it's long overdue. <laughs> I just so these, so these, years ago. These, these fees are typical across the board, like in the New Rochelle or Yonkers where they have this, because I've used it. Yeah. All so right. in, in a, you know, I, I think by this point in the process, I think I've spoken to every single community in Westchester about what uh, they're doing. Um, I think Dale and Karen can probably confirm that because I've been driving them nuts. Um, there are certainly some communities that pass the, the whole amount along. It would not be unusual to do that. Um, I don't want to name names, but, you know, there are certainly communities to, to our, our very near uh, north and south um, who pass along the entire fee and they have they have perfectly good usage. Um, they, they don't feel it's hindered them at all to, to pass the entire cost along, which again, in this case, would be 32 cents per transaction. Um, and of course, that's in addition to what you're actually paying to park your car, they're same as you would with quarters. Um, so that, that we shouldn't feel like we absolutely must do one thing or the other. Um, if, if the board's opinion is, let's get a benchmark, um, you know, at, at the, the full 32 cents and we could take it down or the other way around. Um, you know, we'll, we'll certainly get data within the first year um, after having done so. But um, th I don't believe that, that we're going to be handicapped uh, by taking the conservative route um, and, and charging the full freight at least to start. Um, I, you know, if, if that is going to be a concern, um, I think that, that that's also a safe way to go. And what, what's, our, what's our net? What do you set at for 15 minutes? Or do you have a number that what it would? So I go to that app and I want to park for 15 minutes I'm going to be charged what it's it depends so if we set it up as a bundle you're going to pay 32 cents in addition to your quarter um no matter how how long you park if we do it on a, a percentage basis where the village is going to absorb part of it the village would absorb three percent plus about 22 cents um so again depending on the length of your stay it's going to vary um so in, in both cases, it's, you know, between 25 and 32 cents. It's, it's a very narrow margin between the two choices. Okay. And I can presume that we've added the cost of uh, maintenance and, and the labor of the meter readers and everything into this package because it's, it costs us money for these people to watch this and maintain it. It's not well, done I mean, for nothing. They're, they're watching them now. Um, so right now, the, the difference is that they, they walk past the parking meter. If they see a red light, they, they know that the person hasn't paid and they write a ticket. Uh, what will happen now is if they see the red light, they're going to say, uh-oh, I better check the app. They're going to swipe the license plate with their handheld, and it's going to tell them whether the person is paid or not. Um, so it, it's not you know much more of a lift on, on the parking enforcement officers than, than what they're doing currently. Well, I'm not saying as much as a lift. I'm just saying, well, I guess it's, it's a wash. Never mind. There, there's done. no cost to, I mean, separate and apart from the conversation we're having about the potential uh, absorption of the credit card fees, there's no charge to the village for, for this service whatsoever. Uh, we already have the handhelds. Um, the handhelds are used to produce parking tickets. The, the company gets a cut of the parking tickets. That's always been the case. Um, but this doesn't cost us anything additional. We already have the hardware. This isn't anything extra. Okay, I'll stop being a consumer. I'm done. So they ask, I think the question is plan A or plan B or plan hybrid C, I guess. You asked which plan you want. You came up with a third one. Okay. Um, and I mean, I just voiced my opinion. I, I think there's some agreement to it. I, I've heard uh, from most. I didn't hear from Dana or Manny, but I'm seeing the head shaking. So Medi, you came in, um, you're still walking out with a hybrid, I think, right? It sounds to me like for the first year um, or perhaps six months, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, we're going to start with the village absorbing the credit card fee, um, and we'll check in periodically with the board and let them know, you know, what what number we've reached. Um, and then if we reach a point where the village says, nope, that's enough, uh, that that's more than we can stomach, then we can toggle over to to the other alternative. And like I said, I can speak with the vendor first thing in the morning and, and confirm that that's possible. And we're keeping everything else the same till 6 p.m. Because many towns yeah. now are 8 p.m. or 24 hours. I was just in White Plains. It's like 24 hours. They change that. But we're keeping everything else as equal. And no, then this. Okay. Nothing else has changed. Okay. So just so, asking. So, yeah, no. Two questions. I'm sorry. I just had two questions. Uh, right now, our meter is half. You press the button, you have, I think, 20 minutes. You get a free 10 minutes with the button. Oh, 10 yeah. minutes. Thank you. 10 yeah. minutes. So that is going to go away. Nope. 
You still have that. You're still going to have that. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's not going anywhere. Good, because that's my favorite. <laughs> that's everyone's <laughs> favorite. Every time we have conversations about doing something favorite. with parking, everyone says, as long as I can still have my the one the other one that we're looking on the parking study sure is that we're analyzing you know different sectors two hours three yeah. hours an hour and so the prices are mm -hmm. still going to be the same the ratio of the of the hourly is still going to be the same as we have and now it just may change you know how many hours um you park in different spots or what sections do you park to mm -hmm. to be able to park at two hours something like that I think I heard everything you said, but the fire alarm is going off behind me. So I just want to make sure. Yeah, I what is that? Um, I thought it was something in my house. No, no it's, it's uh, in our house. My, it's my, <laughs> the fire has around the corner from my house. Okay, excellent. I think so, those are two different initiatives. Maddie, I think the question yeah. Trustee Quesada is asking is we have other initiatives. Yeah. I think this is like one initiative. The other no, initiative no, is no, about the, the timing yeah. and zoning, yeah, no, you know, so like the, where the it goes. I was asking that to just keep in mind, which I don't mind the hybrids. I think is a great idea, but just keep in mind like, a little bit of what Omar was talking about. And, and I think what we were talking about is like just recently, just now, um, the, the town court, you are able to pay a lot. And I was just looking at their website. You know, there's a uh, $3 and... Mm -hmm. It's 50 cents right? fee yeah. charge that you have yeah. to pay for each transition is not you know a ratio the other thing that we have to keep in mind as well i, I think the amounts though it's because i think the amounts are different we're talking about 25 cents oh, no, no 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 i'm not no, no, i, I think that. that's what's no. causing some of that no i look i i had this and and that wasn't part of this uh, this depth discussion that i had with tom back in the day when we start first uh having a credit card access on, and, and it was funny when Dell was talking about the water that's exactly when tom and i had a, i think it was more like um two hour discussions offline about why they're charging this percentage you know when someone wants to pay uh with a credit card and, and that again i don't want to get into that whole thing but yeah. um that's why a lot of people just pay by check you know they don't have to pay that fee anyway uh but I, we did um not that long ago on the bill on department when we went online there was an additional fee that was going to be charged by the vendor and it was a built-in within the application itself so i think after a certain point after a whole year of seeing where we are with with this test with this pilot test that we're going to create I think that's something that the board should look into it as well. Is like, you know, what does that look like? Um, and I think that would be helpful for, for us to understand that. Uh, but I, I'm going to agree with this hybrid pilot. Um, it's a good idea and the way to go right now. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the, the dialogue and the back and forth because this is, you know, this is obviously something that, that we've all, you know, considered and, you know, have, have worked really hard to, to try to understand the implications on both sides. Um, I, I think that, that the pilot idea is a great one. So thank you for that. Um, I guess we could call it a pilot so the consumers might understand it, that there's an end to it. Pilots have ends to them, theoretically. Right. Right, and there, there are many there are many communities that that do similar things. Right, they they allow you know, you know, certain promotions for the first couple of weeks just to get everybody up to speed on on using the new technology. Um, you know, we that we can definitely you know the chief has assured me that you know we're going to have a very coordinated, robust rollout of this so that everybody right. is, is very comfortable. So I, I think this is a great um, solution. Yeah. So thank yeah, you buddy. to everyone. Come on. Come on. Great. Come on. Come on. Somebody well, talking in the background? Okay. <laughs> That's stale. All right. Village manager, we're on the last item. We are. Um, so uh, right now we will um, uh, now be having a corporation council talk about a somewhat related item on um, accepting uh, credit card uh, fees and payments online. Thank you, Karen. Uh, a little bit more esoterica. Uh, if the board uh, wants, the board can approve a resolution which will allow for the payment of penalties, rates, taxes, fees, charges, revenue, financial obligations, or other amounts uh, through an internet website, uh, which uh, 
I'm not sure if we do actually now, but this would just sort of make it all, to use the phrase, legal. Uh, and uh, it's essentially, it does not require a local law. It's essentially a resolution uh, where the uh, board would determine that it's in the public interest uh, to provide for such payments uh, via the internet. Uh, the important thing is that uh, payment by the internet may not be the only method for collecting these, these amounts. People would still have the ability to pay uh, through other means, just coming in or anything like that. Uh, but uh, uh, it is just a means of allowing additional, an, an additional method of payment, which would be to pay via the internet. Uh, as Trustee Kazad has noted, the court is now accepting payments with regard to parking tickets via, uh, uh, via uh, that way, uh, which they did not before. That's, that's, a, that's a recent uh, change. Uh, so this would allow the village to similarly accept uh, such payments uh, through uh, an internet, through, the, through its own internet site or through the website of a third party vendor. So that's the, uh, the ask here would be if the board wants to do this, we could have a resolution for the 7th of July uh, authorizing uh, such, uh, such means of payment. What are we talking about? Like uh, PayPal, like what, uh, any, any platform, specific ones? Is There's there... no specific platform that's obviously referenced in the statute, but it would be means that someone could, you know, just make their payment, you know, through, you know, through the internet, you know, in terms of uh, payment, it could be PayPal, it could be through uh, uh, charges in, in some other way, but it does provide for the internet to, to, to do this as a way. This came up because there was a question paid, posed to the general counsel at NICOM, and he came back and cited to two sections, one of which is section five, which allows for payment by credit card, and then the section 5B, which allows for payment over the internet. Uh, we already have approved a couple of years ago, this a prior board approved the uh, acceptance of payment by a credit card. This would allow payment via the internet if the board is so inclined. So I, it's just being presented to the board because they're sort of married together. Comments? I'm not sure if, um, so, so a quick question on this one. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of what that is, sure, um, there's a fee included to these uh, type of payments, correct? Whatever the vendor may, may ask for I, that I would, to be I would, I, I, I would certainly presume that unless it's being done directly by the, the village, the answer is yes. Yeah. There, would be some, there would be some associated fee, which gets us into the discussion we just had with regard to other types of fees. So oh. is, this, is this the same thing as um, like in a building permit situation for the building department? Um, th will they be able to use a program similar to this uh, in effect if that's not provided um, within the program or the vendor that we have? I don't, I, I don't see why they could not. Uh, it would be basically village-wide. We could, we, could, we could use those uh, platforms if in fact they're available. Uh, and that's a matter I, I would obviously discuss with Maddie, Dale, and with Craig in terms of you know vendors and things like that. But this at least gives the option to do it that way, uh, which yeah. uh, is not there right now. So the, Dale, quick question. Right now you're able to pay your taxes online? Your village? Maddie says yes. Yes, yes. Okay. You can pay village, uh, you can pay taxes and you can pay water. Okay, so and actually, uh, I also do um, some hardship parking. If somebody okay. does it electronically, okay. I can I can do an uh, an invoice and upload it uh, yeah. into Express Pay. Um, so, yeah, we're so we're, in the we're, same. Maybe you know, in store or Maddie may know or Karen may know. So, the a village clerk was early here today as well. And there are some functions that you know we utilize a lot with them, except for dog licenses, we don't do that anymore. That's a good thing. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other functions in there in, in her department. So this will also, be, when you said 
uh, sort of village wide. So this will cover everything, no matter what DPW community center. I'm assuming as well. Everything. Good. Sure. Sure. Okay. So it, it basically because is, yeah, it's in the interest to provide for except. I mean, they, could you put limits on it? Yes, but uh, effectively it would allow for uh, uh, it, it. It could it could go across all village departments. Yes, trustee. Design. I mean, in a way, we're doing that already. So to me, it seems like it's more like a formality, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm misreading this whole thing. I mean, we are doing this thing already. Uh, every, all the payments are aligned, you know, and that's through a web uh, browser. Um, so I think it's just, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, Stuart, this is more a formality that, that we are trying to pass, correct? I just, would I, would I yeah, I don't think the board ever authorized a resolution gotcha. to do what we do. So Got it. It's just essentially to cross that team. <laughs> All right, so we put in this. I got it, Stuart. Thank you. Um, we I'm have okay learned a lot the last yeah. couple of weeks. Oh, <laughs> you also have does. to. You also yeah, have to. Always, set, yeah. You really have to be a little bit careful, especially with yeah. the systems we have. Um, sure. PayPal, Venmo. Um, I just went through this earlier today. I swear, it's like I live a double life. We just had this huge conversation where I work. Um, of when we accept PayPal, when we accept Venmo, and there are charges, also charges on refunds. So municipalities you know, probably don't do a lot of refunds, but there are also fees going the other way. Um, so you just have to be careful that you understand. Um, there's also huge um, cybersecurity issues once monies are transferred like this. So somebody has to really follow the dollar here, the digital dollar. Um, of what because you have to set it up on both sides you have to be a recipient as well and not everybody zoom uh, for example does not accept when they do charge for things um all the platforms because they have contracts uh, with different platforms so i'm just saying I, I don't know how i understand Stuart, what you're doing but this doesn't mean that we accept all platforms all whips i mean like somebody has to manage this and i don't know who does that in our village and i'm not i don't really need to have that conversation now but this really needs to be managed and there are different fees for different platforms and how they chart so it's all i, I ask is that that be managed yeah. but as far as the the legal part of let's put in writing that we accept it and uh, via website i'm okay with that because as it's been pointed out we've sort of been doing that anybody not okay with it All righty. Anything else? All right. Everybody's shaking their head. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are um, ready to take a vote to adjourn um, this session for June 23rd, and we are at 9.31. Mayor, we would adjourn to executive session for matters of personnel regarding a specific person. So moved. Second. I need a second. Second? I second it. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, folks.